وصحبه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا يا ربنا من فضلك علما وإخلاصا وحلما We have reached the ninth hadith in the chapter of Mujahada which roughly translates as putting in the work from Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu qad صليت مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ليلة فأطاد القيام. It looks like we read number nine before. Does anybody recall where we left off? I think we kept with the sujood. I believe it was one of three, Sheikh. Yes, it was one of three. We read the long one. Yes, we ended with the. See, I think that's what we started with last time. Yes, we stopped in the middle yes. of hadith number 17 because we knew we wouldn't be able to treat it appropriately. Allah, you better keep We're going to have to do a better job of keeping track. And what I'll do is I'll make a test for certain at the end of every lesson. I'll put the date in the margin, inshallah. And then it will be there as a memory of the time that we spent together. Sayyid. So we have begun hadith number 17, Abdab al-Mujahada, which is reported by Abi Dhar, whose name was Jundab ibn Junada, radiallahu anhu an al sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith Qudsi, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi, O my slaves, inni haram to dhulma ala nafsi, I have prohibited dhulm from myself. Effectively, in our aqidah, because dhulm is impossible for an owner against the things that he legitimately owns. Now, you could have an owner who makes oppression on something that he owns, even according to a man-made law. But does he legitimately own that thing, object, or person in the greater scheme of the universe? So for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oppression for those things that he owns, which are those things that he has created, is actually impossible. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, I have legislated the prohibition against myself from oppressing any person, he is one making a statement that he has freely chosen that he will not do anything to any of his subjects or any of his creation that is not in their best interest, uh, that is not good in the greater scheme of things. He's chosen to do that. That not in and of itself is a wisdom that manifests in the cone even though it may seem like a sorry and unfortunate and difficult state of affairs for us and the ultimate scheme of things it is good because it is the choice of the sovereign and the creator he has declared and promised that this is his free choice because the reality is is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have to do good for anyone. There is no compulsion on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But everything that he does is essentially just, no matter what. So it's a promise that he will not condone either in any of his legislation, in revelation, or in the sharia, as it comes from the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and the revelation of the Qur'an, he was 
in the hermeneutical methods of usul al-fiqah, that there will be nothing there that is oppression for anyone either. This is what's happening when Allah says it, and He's modeling the source of goodness when it comes to the treatment of others, starting with Himself. So if dhulm is prohibited from the divine essence or by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his own self, then where does anyone else come off doing something that they know will harm other people and is unfair? وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ مُحَرَّمًا Am I correct? وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ مُحَرَّمًا Oh, mashallah, my memory is not that bad after all. فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا And then comes the command a prohibition, do not oppress or wrong one another. Hmm? This is in Sahih Muslim. Does it get any more serious than this? Hmm. This is your identity as a Muslim, then. Right? Because after Bukhari and Muslim, what do we need? Um, what do we need to say that this is essential to the nature of the identity of the believer in the world where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says ittaqu da'wat al-mazlum fa inna fa innahu laysa baynahu wa bayna Allah hijab fear the prayer of the oppressed of those who have been wronged of those who have been unfairly treated because there is no veil between them and Allah are we thinking of a bunch of refugees in a refugee camp somewhere that somebody, you know, is forcing them out of their homes, fear the prayer of the people in the refugee camp? Are we thinking of the brother or sister in the masjid who has been unfairly marginalized, unfairly treated, unfairly forced out, uh, unfairly overlooked? Are we thinking of our family members and the way that we treat our family members because it applies as well? If we would only take a little time as educated Muslims and not Muslims who perhaps have never had the opportunity in their life huh, to learn to read or to graduate from high school or something along these lines so we don't expect that much from them. But as educated Muslims, if we would just take a little bit of time to understand a little bit about how the words and sentences and statements of the Qur'an and Hadith signify and indicate the meanings that they do. We would see that that Hadith that is narrated by quite a few narrators fear the prayer of the ones who have been wronged because there is no veil between them and Allah doesn't apply only to people in refugee camps somewhere. That the application is general. And if we wanted, we could take it to another level and read the version in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. اِتَّقُوا دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ وَلَوْ كَانَ كَافِرًا فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٌ Fear the prayer of the one who has been unjustly, unfairly treated and wronged even if a non-Muslim because there is no veil between them and Allah. Remember, this informs your identity, who you are as a believer. If you want to go and testify at a town council meeting or a neighborhood homeowners association, and you want to say, we Muslims, be careful. It might be better for you to say, we Scottish Americans, we South Asian Americans, we Arab Palestinian Americans, that's safer for you to say. That is a safer identity for you to cling to than saying we Muslims. Because now, once you said that in front of all of those people, every single person can testify against you in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment. If you do not comport yourself according to the recipe the prescription for healing that they need. 
Oh, how we wished and loved that we might see our brothers, a people who will come after me and believe in me not having ever met me. Huh? He said that a person be guided to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a convert to Islam on your hands is better for you than what? A hundred red Teslas. Right? Isn't that what he said? I get the narration wrong. But that's pretty much it, isn't it? Huh? That was what Yadhulu uh, Hadinu Kulla Baitin Wabarin Wa Madarin Awla Yetru Kullahu Baita Wabarin Wala Madarin illa Al Khalahu Hadin. Allah will not leave a house of camel hair or of clay except that he will enter this deen. What's the point of saying camel hair or clay? We all know camel hair means, right, an expensive tent, right? The best tents are the ones the outer tent is made of camel hair. It's usually black and then there's a inner tent that's made of quilt. Huh? And clay. Why both? To say all houses with no exception. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said or his messenger said, Allah will not leave any apartment or trailer or estate except that he will bring this deen to it. Let's not be the people who stand in the way of that from happening. What was the intention of Rasulullah for the shores beyond where he reached? What was the intention of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq beyond the shores of where he reached? What was the intention and mission of Umar ibn al-Khattab and Uthman ibn Athan and Ali ibn Abi Talib karramu Allahu wajhahu wa radiyallahu anhum jami'an What were their intentions for the shores beyond where they reached? Hmm? Musa ibn Nusayr arrives at the shores at Messa in the south of Morocco in Sus to the Atlantic Ocean and he waves in with his sword raised and said, Wallahi, if I knew that there were lands beyond this ocean, I would carry to them this deen and seek no reward from anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember when, before we were Muslim, myself and my friend Abd Aziz, we would go to the shore at Seabright, it's down from Rumson in New Jersey. We would sit, we would imagine what was on the other side. We would listen to a lot of African music at the time. Right? But we thought that somewhere over there is something that's not here. Somewhere over there might be something that is better than where we find ourselves now. And we used to do that on a regular basis and just imagine and think. SubhanAllah. This is your identity. You can take on the mantle of that identity or you can leave it. And if you don't have the capacity or the aptitude to carry this mantle, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to let you slide. But if you do, well, there's a good chance that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will admit you, inshallah. But he probably won't want to look at you. No. فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا Do not mistreat other people. يَا عِبَادِي كُلُّكُمْ ضَالٌ إِلَّا مَنْ هَدَيْتُمْ And we uh, went through this last week. O oh, my slaves, all of you are misguided except for the one that I guided. So seek guidance from me and I will guide you. And how many of us have questions and puzzles that we have to figure out in our life? The reason why dua, supplication, is the marrow of ibadah is because in it you demonstrate that you know where to go to get what you need. You know who to ask. Ya ibadi, all of you are hungry. 
unless I feed them. So ask me to feed you, and I'll feed you. Allah won't tell me. Ya ibadi kullukum aarin illa man kasautu. All of you are naked except the ones that I have clothed, clothed. So seek clothing from me and I will clothe you. Subhanallah. Ya ibadi innakum tukhti'oona bil layli wa nahari wa ana aghfiru dhunuba jami'a. My slaves, you sin by day and you sin by night and I forgive all sins. فَاسْتَغْفِرُونِي أَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ اللَّهُمَّ أَغْفِرْ لَنَا اللَّهُمَّ أَغْفِرْ لَنَا اللَّهُمَّ هَا نَحْنُ نَسْتَغْفِرُكَ فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا يَا عِبَارِي إِنَّكُمْ لَنْ تَبْلُغُوا ضُرِّي فَتَضُرُّونِي وَلَنْ تَبْلُغُوا نَفْعِي فَتَنْفَعُونِي My slaves, none of you are able to harm me such that harm will come to me, and none of you are able to seek to give benefit to me, such that you actually benefit me. Allah does not need us. The sooner we realize that, the better. Allah does not need me, Allah does not need my prayer, Allah does not need my salah, Allah does not need my fasting. Nothing that I do brings benefit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I were to fulfill one of his commands or avoid or stay away from one of his prohibitions. It only benefits me. Of course, for those things that I am the one who is harmed if I do not meet the command or the prohibition, but it doubly harms me and harms another person if there's a victim of this particular violation or failure to act. But let's look more important at none of you can hurt me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Nobody can hurt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone over there is not doing what they're supposed to do, if someone over there is not acting as we believe a Muslim should act, or doing the things we think Muslims are supposed to do. Are they hurting Allah? They're not hurting Allah. So why is it that I feel like I have to get into their business? Why is it that I feel like I have to nudge someone next to me and point over there and say, look at what that person's doing, astaghfirullah? Is it the way of the representative of the one who said, Inni bu'ithtu ila nasi kafa, or inni rahmatun muhdat, I am a gift of mercy to the world. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I say that I represent that one to drive through the streets and look at what non Muslims are doing, saying, A'udhu billah, astaghfirullah. Suffer Allah doesn't work until you say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They say about a kufri them. Huh? So, I, I mean, I either my business is that I'm from this country and I'm in my homeland, or my business is that I chose to come here and live here, and then I act like I'm dissatisfied with here, and I got a problem with here. Subhanallah. There are Muslim countries that a person could have chosen where there's nothing wrong in the streets and everything is just as lovely as can be. No, but there are no bars, right? Those, you know, those doors and those buildings with the no windows and stuff like that, right? They, on the other, what's, what people say is on the other side of that door isn't there, right? There's no discos, there's no what have you, there's no prostitution. There's no abortion, there's no homosexuality, there's no AIDS, there's no... Except for the AIDS wards in every hospital in those countries, but we don't talk about that, right? Because there's nothing labeled on the hallway to that particular ward. Huh? But everything's perfect over there, so if we're looking for perfection, then let's go to the place where the perfection is. Let's go to Shangri-La. There is no Shangri-La. Really, really, there is no Shangri-La. 
except the one that you make in your heart. Huh? The peace and the serenity and the tranquility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to you when you accept his qada and his qada. Huh? Subhanallah. We can't hurt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody's hurting Allah. Maybe they're hurting themselves and maybe we want to help them in a way that benefits them. But what is very important that when we seek to help a brother or sister, we stop, we think. First thing we do is we say, is what they're doing actually permissible on any madhab? Because the rule of censuring others is that لا ينكر المختلف فيه إنما ينكر المجمع عليه in the Ashbah wa Nadair of Suyuti. Something that there's a difference of opinion on among the scholars is not to be criticized, is not criticized. You only can criticize what is agreed upon, what there's actual formal consensus on across the board. And then, the way that we would seek to help a brother and sister, is it a way that I've understood will help them and they will be responsive to, or is it just a way that makes me feel better about myself? Or makes me feel like I'm here to go tell people off and let them know how it is, because you know, that sister, she's like Omar ibn al-Khattab. Right, isn't that what they say? No. She's not like Omar ibn al-Khattab, nor is the brother, because none of us are like any of the Sahaba. And who's Omar ibn al-Khattab? You mean Omar ibn al-Khattab in Mecca? before the Hijrah, or Umar ibn al-Khattab during the life of the Prophet ﷺ, or Umar ibn al-Khattab during the life of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the opposite extreme, radiallahu anhumah, or Umar ibn al-Khattab the Khalifa, because that's a different Umar. No. Umar was in a process of growth and development. So maybe we can be like Umar like that. Let's be in a process of growth and development and become better people. You were a great person yesterday, but you can be an even greater person tomorrow. Inshallah, all of us together are working on ourselves and becoming better people. And you might inspire positive change all around you by just being. And in Allah's agenda, on Allah's schedule, people will be affected by all those changes that you bring about by just being and the power the influence of being by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rabbi. Unfortunately, for the kids who still live at home with their parents, it's not always that easy. Because the parents are responsible to, you know, keep the red lines. Right? But then, certain things do apply to the kids too. In this country, it doesn't work forcing religion down the throats of, of teenagers. It just push, push them away. And we have to think about that paradigm, we have to think of that model, right? One time, two times, three times in the Islamic schools. We don't want to have Islamic schools where kids are just counting the days until they can graduate and go off to college and just never look back. Because it was such a hor how I mean, people who went to Catholic school, I mean, we hear a lot of people talking about their Catholic school experiences and they're not exactly trying to be good Catholics anymore. You know, I'm sure that there must be some people who graduated from Catholic school and stayed serious about Catholicism. But that's not the story that you hear in this country. It doesn't work with American teenagers. And if your child was born here in America, well, just compare. How good is their Urdu? And how good is their English? Which language are they more comfortable with? So in this country, it doesn't work like that. But if your child sees the serenity that comes from you after you say your prayer and then you fold up your prayer rug and go back and you are that loving parent, that caring parent, huh? not saying anything about the deen to them maybe, but they notice that or they see how the peace that comes over you or the fact that stress seems to be relieved, relieved when you regularly sit and read from the Qur'an and then you shut it, you put it back and say nothing to them about that. They remember that. They see that. They may not see it this month. They may not see it this year. They may not see it until their memories come back to them in their 20s or their 30s 
and they face something and say, I have no peace in my life right now. But I remember my mother had so much peace when she would pray. Something was going on between her and the one that she was praying to that gave her so much contentment and life couldn't have been that easy for her either. And they might find their way back. But if we beat them with the dean, no one wants to come back and embrace a stick. You know, if the dean has become a stick. We can't hurt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so let's watch out. No. Ya ibadi lo enna awalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum kanu ala etka kalbi rajulin wa hidin minkum maza de darika fi mulki shay. My slaves, if the first of you and the last of you and the men, the mankind of you and the jinn kind of you were all in accordance with the most pious and God-conscious heart from among you, that would still not increase my kingdom one iota. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kamil mukammal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wahidun, fardun, ahadun, samadun, ghaniyun. He needs nothing. But everyone needs him. And that position can only be for one. Those are the two conditions of the meaning of the word worthy of worship. When we say that an ilah, a god, is something that is worshipped and people deem that something to be worthy of worship, what does it mean to be worthy of worship when we say there is none? that is worthy of worship, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, two conditions. That this one has no need of anything beyond himself. And the second condition, everything other than himself is in utter need of him. And if you think about it with your logical brain, right, you'll see that that can only be for one entity, one single entity, and that is the one that is worthy of worship. And that's the meaning of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, As-Samad. Yusuf Ali would translate as the eternally besought by all, right? That was condition two. But we need to also add condition one, right? And then it becomes As-Samadaniya, which is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يا عبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كانوا على أفجار قلبي رجل واحد منكم ما نقص ذلك من ملك شيء My slaves are the first of you and the last of you and the mankind of you and the jinn kind of you all in accordance with the most evil and corrupt heart of anyone from among you that would not decrease my kingdom one iota. Ya ibadi lo enna awalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum qamu fi sa'idin wahidin fa sa'aluni fa a'taytu kulla insanin mas'alatah ma naqasa dharika mimma indi illa kama yamkusu al-makhitu ila udakhila al-bahru. My slaves, were the first of you and the last of you and the ins of you and the jinnakum all to stand up in one place and ask me at the exact same moment. And I gave every single person exactly what they asked of me. That would not decrease what I have any more than a needle if dipped into the ocean. How much would that take away from the ocean? Nothing. That's why we say, they said, Alika Allah the Aziz. It's not impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all of us people of Jannah here tonight. Everyone in this masjid. Throw in people in the housing development across the street too. Allah can do that tonight. That we even not be asked on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do that. And we know that he can do that. And we know that he is wonderful and wondrous and great and generous. And he doesn't have to be. 
and everything that appears beautiful to us is only from Him. And everything that appears ugly to us is only from Him, and in it is a wisdom which gives it a facet of beauty. And we accept that. And all we do is ask that He forgive us here tonight, all of us here in this neighborhood, in Pleasanton, because that's not difficult for Him. And he can do it. Huh? And it won't take anything away. SubhanAllah. We'll keep working like we're going to die tomorrow, inshallah. And God just carry our faults for us. Now, Ya ibadi innama hiya a'malakum u'asuyha lakum thumma u'afikum iyaha. MashaAllah. My slaves, verily it is nothing more than your actions. I keep track of them for you. SubhanAllah. Imagine. An accountant who works for free. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he'll keep track of everything for you. MashaAllah. But that's kind of a scary bookkeeper. Allah help us. Allah be generous with us and gentle. Ya Rabbi Allah Mastur. I record them on your behalf and then I reward you in accordance. Faman وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Whoever finds good should praise Allah. وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ فَلَا يَلُومَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ And whoever finds other than that, other than khair, should not blame anyone but themselves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, we blame ourselves. Allah, we blame ourselves. Allah, we blame ourselves. And please just carry us through. Because that list is just going to get longer and longer so long as you keep us alive. And we're just going to do what Benny Adam does. And we're going to keep doing what Benny Adam does. We can promise you that. But if you could just keep doing what our Hamar Rahimin does, then I think we'll be okay. That's the end of the chapter. And we're getting close to 8 o'clock, right? <laughs> six minutes, inshallah. Yeah, nobody can say six minutes to me without me going all the way back to Dougie Fresh, your own. Right. Tell you. So we've reached the end of the chapter of Mujahida with a lot of encouragement to engage in a little bit of Mujahida or that. Allah help us and give us tawfiq in our intentions to be mujahideen ala ilik. Know that there is no such thing as a mujahid who attempts to make any type of jihad in a set of circumstances that is mukhalifa of the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger, that is in contradiction or in violation of the teachings of Allah and His Messenger. Someone who engages in something can call it whatever they want, but it's just criminal activity. Or misplaced and wasted effort, because there's all types of jihad. And the types of jihad that are legitimate in a particular moment are legitimated by the circumstances of that time and place, and the authority with which the choices are being made. We were much more sophisticated people legally 100 years ago than we are today. We are much more sophisticated thinkers. We were, those who were educated among us may have been fewer in number, but we were a bit smarter than most of the people that we have today, even though our number is larger. And when the Prophet ﷺ says that the best generation is my generation, and then those that follow, and then those that follow, and if we were to take that to his logical conclusion, that would mean where we are at now, the generation that came to an end before our generation started is better than ours. And the next one is better than them, and the next one back in history is better than them, and then we might be led to ask the question, how is that possible if we have penicillin? How is that possible, you know, if we have antibiotics and all of these other things that 
we have heart replacement surgery and we have a better human rights regime you know internationally and we do tell you and we have and we have and we have all of this thing indoor plumbing how is it that they're better than us when we have so much more and then the literacy rates are higher now than they ever been in human history how is it that they're still better than us and we keep improving and improving but that's true we do keep improving and improving and we do have a superiority over the generations that went before us in all of those things that are quantifiable in quantity true we are superior but in quality not the quality of human beings in this epic is not close at all to those who went before us so while mankind might be increasing in quantifiable material it is decreasing in the quality of human beings that they are the quality of decisions that are being made that's a discussion for another time so chapter 12 is باب الحذف على الازدياد من الخير في اواخر العمر the encouragement to engage in goodness and good actions at the end of one's life in the last days of one's life no. so when the last days of your life start right that's the time to start making sure that you're seeking for opportunities to do better right so whenever you've got that scheduled right that's your start date no. how are we for getting close to the economy? Two minutes, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. We'll read the first ayah and then we'll close for tonight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Awalan nu'ammirkum ma yatadhakkar fihi man tadhakkar wa ja'akum an nadheer. Subhanallah. Surah Al-Fatiha. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَلَمْ نُعَمِّرْكُمْ Do we not give you advanced age? وَمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرُ And nobody huh, understands, nobody gets it, nobody considers what that means getting on in years, and the warner has come to you. And who is the warner? All of those things that remind you that you're getting older. That's your start date. If you even make it that far. Allahumma let us get all the distance in a good fashion, with a good ending, pleasing to you and with contentment in our hearts, not just for the, in the life of this world, but a sustainable contentment of the heart for this world. The sustainable contentment of the heart in this world is a state of being that will enable us to also have contentment of heart in the next world. Ya Rabbi, Allahumma ameen wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.